So a customer can actually be related to other customers. Um, they can be related to other people as well. So mm -hmm. here we have a way of just looking at customer relationships. Uh, if you want to look at it in that visual mode, we do have this down here. Um, so you have, you know, a quote unquote graph visual view of Marissa Stanton, the customer with all of her different accounts. Um, and you can envision, you know, this being used to in, in kind of anti-money laundering or fraud use cases. Of the Palantir IBM relationship, pretty much from the beginning, right since November. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's uh, what's one or two things that you uh, you've learned, you know, about ontologies or you know, just big uh, revelations that you think you've learned? So the most interesting uh, aspect of this Palantir product is the operationalizing part, like the active decision making. We always had the entire data and AI or the entire AI ladder. Uh, defined on our cloud pack for data but we never had something where you can right at the moment take a decision on your uh, on your ontology or your data set whatever you call and then uh, like translate those decisions into the into real world so like integrating this with our existing cloud pack for data services really uh, uh, really gives the joint value proposition that we are looking for the right back model where you know changes you know say you're you have an action on a specific you know within our low code application we all see that the actions are are clicked and you know that is then fed back into the model and the model gets smarter the more actions you take on it right yeah, yeah, the feedback is very important for a machine learning model, especially for a deep learning model if you have a reinforcement. You come from a data science background, so how is the transition to using Palantir tools uh, different for you? I mean, you must be, you know, Jupyter Notebooks must be your favorite place mm -hmm. to code, so how was it for you? But Palantir also, like, you don't need to be a coder or you don't need to be any kind of uh, SME to create that no code application it is very like intuitive the the user experience in palantir foundry is uh, super smooth we now want to show a little bit of what's under the hood of you know how do you actually create those applications what does that no code uh, low code environment look like objects as the starting ground of you know utilizing the data and having ai infused workflows so really then the first thing i want to show is how did you even create those objects um, on one hand, of course, there is the, the underlying data sets coming from Watson Knowledge Catalog. But I want to show here is really how w we create objects and really form that ontology. Um, so what you're seeing here is something we call the ontology uh, management application. And just going into the customer object to show how we set these up. Um, so what you're seeing here is this view that end users can actually use to create new objects based on their underlying data set. And again, the emphasis is on no coding. It's a, a lot of point and click configuration type um, attributes that this tool has. So for example, looking at the customer object, what are you really doing is plugging in underlying data source. Once you do that, what this tool is doing is reviewing all the properties of that data set and allowing the end user to configure what those should look like. So if I go into edit mode, you can see here's the underlying data set with probably way more columns than you'll need. Um, and I'm just selecting a subset of those to actually form my object. Um, so now you can see these are the objects uh, I've, or these are the properties I've created for the customer object. And if I want to, I can go in and really set up their metadata and you know, decide on rendering hints. Once I do this, you can, you have an object and now you can set up linkages. And that's really the power of the ontology is starting to mirror what uh, the real world really is using your data in the form of objects and relationships to each other. So you can see here, my customer is probably related to the accounts that they've opened. Um, there may be certain alerts flagged on this customer um, if there's some kind of fraud. So you're really starting to expand to different types of use cases. Uh, you have you know, different uh, metrics that might be related to them. And all of this gives you a single view, almost from a developer point of view, but without needing to know the coding of your data and how you want to manage it. So if I go back and flash that object explorer view that Shivam um, demoed earlier, you can see this is what we're showing to the end user of all those objects in one place. Uh, and here's how they're actually created in what we call an ontology management application. So quick question about that, and this is actually from me. Um, the links that are uh, kind of created between the objects, is that 
is that something that's created automatically or is that uh, is it via the ontology you know labeling that you were just doing Yep, so there's two ways. Um, so similar to the uh, accelerators that you showed earlier, we have archetypes that already pre-assume for specific industries and specific uh, use mm. cases, you know, what should relate to each other. A customer maybe should always have a link to transactions or accounts, but then you also have the ability to set them up. So looking at customer here, uh, you can see this is how we set the linkage between a customer and a campaign. So many customers can be assigned to many campaigns. In this case, it's a many-to-many -many relation. And again, you know, you can just configure it per your needs on how you want to display the names and whatnot. Let's go back into the customer object. And now you're seeing what's really here is almost an out-of-the-box out display view whenever you set up any object. So you set an object and you maybe determine its most significant properties. That will already be displayed choosing the chart that probably most makes sense for the data. So if it's you know, a set of integers, maybe it's a graph, um, maybe it's a histogram. And I think Shivam already showed how you can remove these if you want, you can add new ones if you want. You don't have to be coding up ways to create these charts. Uh, and the other piece to really touch on that linkage point, you can see here, any kind of object view is not limited to that object itself. And you're sort of open to the full list of relations and bringing those secondary data sets in as well. Um, so in this case, I'm linking it to the retail transactions as well as the in-person meetings with this customer. And you're able to show that all in one place, which is starting to break down you know, silos between data. You know, Can you elaborate a little bit on the uh, bi-directional flow between Palantir and Cloud Factor Data, which I think you were just about to start showing in the next part of your demo here, but did you want to give a little bit of context and flavor to that question before you jump into it? Yeah, so we almost treat all these linkages the same way, whether it's you know linkages between us and the modeling space versus Palantir and the WKC space. Uh, the, the direction is bi-directional, so any kind of data coming in, we are setting up sinks around it to pull at either a regular interval or, or sort of at specific ad hoc intervals. And then the idea is to always have that right back as well to the source system, because as we all know, if you just have a visualization layer that doesn't go anywhere and doesn't you know speak to the ground truth of where the data is coming from, then you're not actually impacting the organization at its key metrics. So the goal is to have bi-directional data at both the modeling uh, and the data layer itself. And on the ontology layer, uh, the question here was, uh, it, it kind of feels like a graph sort of technology fundamentally. Maybe you can elaborate on that one a little bit here. On the product related side, on the IBM side, uh, the question was, can we feed these ontologies and other relationships back into uh, Watson Orchestrate or Watson Assistant to drive smarter conversational interactions? Yeah, so really wanted to speak to the first part of your question around the graph technology. Um, I think there's a lot of different technical industries terms of graph DBs, nodes, all that. And for us, it, it's really very simple. It's just these objects and relationships. And because of that, you can visualize it and kind of um, leverage it in different ways. So here's something that's just uh, looking at an object related to itself. So a customer can actually be related to other customers. Um, they can be related to other people as well. So mm -hmm. here we have a way of just looking at customer relationships. Uh, if you want to look at it in that visual mode, we do have this down here. Um, so you have you know, a quote unquote graph, visual view of Marissa Stanton, the customer, with all of her different accounts. Um, and you can envision you know, this being used to in, in kind of anti-money laundering or fraud use cases, this becomes especially relevant to start visualizing all the relationships between uh -huh. you know the actors and and where that fraud ring actually is, um, quite literally. Uh, so I think there is a lot of overlap with the, the concept of graph, and we really view it as at the most fundamental levels. It, it reminds me of you know in those movies where someone's actually trying to recreate this crime ring on like a you know, cork board. Uh, but yeah, it's awesome that you can just bring this up automatically. The the backbone really is uh, operationalizing AI. So that is the infused ladder or the infused rung of the AI ladder. It's not only visualization, but much more than mm -hmm. visualization. When you create the no code app, you uh, take active decisions. For example, in this use case, uh, you can translate your decisions into the, into the bank with the customers and you can uh, translate those decisions with the marketing campaigns and for different use cases. So this is not only the visualization, but much more. So recommending 
from that AI engine, you know, what are the offers you should give to a customer based on all of their other data? Uh, and same thing is around actions is you're not just here to give an offer to the customer um, and kind of run with it. You really want to record in your system, you know, how do they respond to that offer and how should that influence the models going forward to refine uh, the sort of uh, offers given. And remember the feedback always goes back to the model. It improves the model performance and especially if it is a reinforcement learning model, it will increase uh, multifolds. So this is uh, like the Cognos dashboard or Cognos analytics and Palantir is a bit different here where Cognos dashboard and analytics is uh, for uh, visualization and reporting and dashboarding, uh, whereas Palantir is for visualization plus operationalizing AI, uh, building these no code or low code applications. One or the other, you could use both, but the value of Palantir is as uh, Shivman and Nancy just said. This is the object view. I would wanted to flash this really quickly just to show the edit mode um, and show that, again, this isn't about you know, complex coding or even you know, taking existing widgets and making copies of them and the editing. All this is just point and click tooling, and you can use it to do quite a bit of uh, level of sophistication of these different charts. So here I am in edit view. I have all these widgets. Um, I can go edit them if I would like. So let's say we're not really a big fan of this color red. I can change it to blue um, and that will update right here. And you're always able to see these changes in real time as a developer and see, you know, does this match uh, what I'm going for in this interface? Uh, we have version control. So all of this makes the collaborative environment quite friendly. Uh, so there should be no fear in sort of getting your hands dirty and, and playing around and, and setting up the object views that are needed for your use case. Now I wanted to pivot a little bit to the workshop app itself and talk a bit more about the, the actions. Um, this is the idea of if you're a campaign analyst, your job is to at any given point really be reviewing the health of all your campaigns, um, especially focusing on in the case of underperforming campaigns, you know, are there action steps to be taken? Uh, I believe in the in the case of the mortgage demo, what Shivam showed was, you know, drilling down on this underperforming mortgage campaign. How can I provide more information uh, as this campaign analyst of figuring out, you know, do I make changes to it? Do I add a new campaign? Do I stop this in favor of a new campaign? Uh, these are all the types of questions we expect an end user to have. Um, and they can ask all of these and make those action decisions without needing to understand you know, the model elements or the data sets they need to interact with to make those changes. Um, so looking at this, then I wanted to touch a bit on how to make actions, because I would say probably one of the biggest differentiators of, you know, what is a visualization dashboard versus a use case operational tool um, are these actions. So at the top here, you have a new campaign and you have a modified campaign. And what you're seeing here is here's that campaign object being loaded here. Uh, against all the other campaigns that are available, and you're making changes to them via essentially editing the properties on that object. Um, so at the end of the day, all an action is, is an edit on the object itself. So you can be editing properties or you can be creating or deleting entire objects. Um, and in order to do that, we'll dive a bit under the hood here. So you can see there was object types in this uh, management application, then we talked about relations, and now I'm gonna talk about actions. So if I look at my campaign actions, you can see here uh, there is the modify campaign as well as the new campaign action. Looking at the modify one, we can look at the, the logic and you can see all it's doing here is taking the object of campaign to be its target. And then you're able to basically edit any of these property items to be what the user inputs. Uh, so you can do uh, actions on one object or you can do them on multiple objects and you can add multiple different kinds of rules as you see here. So then looking back into that end user case, these are the actions that you can pull up for any one of your applications. So for if you're embedding sort of a campaign management app within an object view, you can pull up these same actions or in the workshop app here you have these actions. And that's what really is a focal point of improving business metrics by allowing the end user to make these changes in a, in a pretty low bar of entry. But yeah, these actions seem to be the the powerful part, as you said, it kind of differenti differentiates uh, Palantir from not just being a visualization tool, but being a, you know, something that an end user can also, you know, uh, help reinforce a, a model or update a model, right? Yep. Um, and 
you know, if we go back into edit mode here, this is very similar to object views. These are all just point and click uh, widgets that you can customize and they all run on the concept of objects. So are you filtering down an object? Are you displaying a table of objects and their properties? You know, are you putting them on a map? Uh, we, and you know, this is the same uh, collaboration environment where you can do version control as you saw earlier. This is what lets you create applications pretty much, you know, in hours and days as opposed to months and sometimes even years. Yeah, for sure, depending on the complexity and how, like creating something like this would take a really long time, even if you had a team of developers. To summarize what we saw today was, you know, step one, how do you take those data sets from WKC to make ontology objects? Uh, once you have them, you can configure how they look, what they're related to, to form that ontology. And then you can display those in the Object Explorer. So we saw that in the Mercer Stand view, where we're bringing all the different data assets uh, that are relevant to the end user in one place. And then finally, and probably most critically, it is the differentiator of from you know just a visualization tool to a operational application are those actions. And this all sort of melds together with AI infused models from WML, the data from WKC into that operational end user layer at Palantir. Uh, what's your favorite part of the Palantir stack to, to work in? Is it the uh, workshop piece? Is the ontology layer? You seem to be pretty quick, uh, pretty comfortable in any piece of the of the Palantir puzzle. So uh, uh, let's see. Out there. Tricky question. Um, I probably, it would be a toss up between the workshop apps, but also I think the object ontology setup management application is very good because you get to start creating a mirroring business there. I think that's the coolest. Uh, if you come from a technical background, I think you're often stuck in the weeds of coding up different things, understand data columns, and you don't think so much about the business objects themselves. Um, but being able to create customer objects and you know, especially for fraud use cases, all those different kinds of tracking, transactions, um, having that in one place and linking it together and seeing those actions pop up, that is pretty cool. You know, it's the second time you've had, you've mentioned fraud as a use case. Is that a common use case that you, I guess you've seen that, you know, your customers work with? Probably because I think right now I have my financial services hat on and that's a major push so far for our go-to-market efforts is there been a lot of interest in the banking sphere and they do a lot of AML work. And I find that super cool uh, in, in a, potential alternate life as a fraud detector, or, uh, I think it would be really cool. Do we have an IBM Cloud or SaaS offering for Palantir as well? Uh, the short answer for that is no right now. As for roadmap, I don't know if we can talk about that i don't know um i've heard some desires to get this on there you know whether or not it makes it out to q3 q4 i'm not sure but uh i think a lot of people have been asking for this uh, feature so can't really say much right now but you know 